Back to the Season 3 World Championship and bonus coverage of the Group B tiebreaker game. It is time for the winner-take-all matchup between Korea's Samsung Galaxy Ozone and Europe's Gambit. The victor will become the eighth and final squad to earn a spot in next week's quarterfinals. Exactly, quick shot. If Ozone take down Gambit, they're going to be the third Korean team in the top eight at Worlds. On the other hand, if Gambit can smash a Samsung Galaxy Nexus, they'll join Fnatic as, uh, as the two European squads in the quarterfinals. And now, this is also the third time these teams have met. They played twice before, split one on one, so this is basically a very belated best of three. Now in game one, Gambit had Ozone pretty much the entire time. They had a two for one trade in the mid lane and they snowballed from there. Genja's Trinity Force Kogma pretty much dunked everybody. Alexis's Ari also went 9 1 and 8. And Gambit had a pretty good game. Now in the other game, Ozone, uh, Imp and Dade, they went pretty crazy. They had a double AD yeah. comp, Caitlyn and Ezreal. And they got the early game lead and played a very controlled push game with double AD. Gave up very, very few kills and just controlled the game the whole way through. Yeah, they completely set the tempo of the game. Just before we look at the uh, lineups, I want to let you guys know that the coin toss was done just off stage during the ad break, and it was Ozone that actually won the toss and elected to be on blue side for this matchup. So let's get right to it and check out those starting lineups on the blue side for this tiebreaker. It is Samsung Galaxy Ozone defending their Samsung Galaxy Nexus. Looper in the top lane, Dandy in the jungle, Dadi in the mid with Imp and Mada as your AD carry and support. And meanwhile, on the red corner, it is Gambit Gaming with Darien up top, Diamond in the jungle, Alex Itch in mid, and Genja Voidal on AD carry and support. And you know, quick shot, looking at these lineups, actually, I actually, you know, think back to the games that they played, and the first win that Gambit got was Diamond dunking people on Evelyn, and there was very little ward coverage, and the analysts were very surprised that no one really warded against the Eve. We just saw yeah. Dandy say, I can play Evelyn too, and so you've got a lot of contested picks on both sides now. Yeah, and not only that, they have to be worried about the Ezreal pick for Dade. Do they want to let that through? Or does Genji want to play? He's not traditionally been the, you know, Ezreal kind of uh, AD carry. He has trained it to, towards other champs. Uh, on the same token as well, we'll see how well that Evelyn gets contested. He's going to pick it up right now. Ari and Caitlyn immediately removed. Zed is still up, and I feel that the onus is on Gambit to ban it out being on the red side. There's actually a lot of really crazy things going on here. You're right that Gambit's probably got to ban out Zed, but it's interesting because with just the Caitlyn ban, they have a lot less to worry about from Ozone's side because uh, when they ran Ezreal plus Vayne, it was kind of awkward. Uh, and it was, it was only because they managed to kind of snowball ahead and make some really good moves uh, that Ozone had a really good game of it. I think just with the Caitlyn ban, they are less worried about Ezreal and they can give that away to Dade without much concern. The Zed ban, of course, is going to come through that. So we do see Sona instantly locked in. The one thing I want to highlight here, Elise still open, Aatrox still open, Evelyn still open as well. And I think Oriana deserves a mention because we have seen both Alex and Dade playing that Oriana. So, there's a lot of champions that these players, these teams have played, and yeah. it's like, well, which two do we want? We, we have to cherry pick here. And Twisted Fate is also one of those champions. Now, I think both these guys love the Assassins. Their primaries are, are definitely like, you want to see uh, like Alex on Ari if you're a Gambit fan, because he just does so much with that champion. He made it happen against Vulcan. He made it happen against Ozone as well. And, and playing those Assassins is so important. But of course, Twisted Fate and Orianna, less impactful for both these teams but still the ones that end up getting played because their top tier ones get banned out. Yeah, we'll have to see how they mitigate this. We do see that Aatrox and Evelyn have been locked in for Gambit, so most likely going to be seeing Diamond running that jungle Eve. However, keep in mind that Alex has run mid lane Eve before. I'm not expecting it. I'm just saying keep it in mind, depending on how the rest of these Ozone picks decide to wrap out. Ozone really taking their time here on uh, the countdown to see who their second and third pick will be. And I was just about to actually mention the fact that he was hovering over Elise because Elise and Lee Sin are both available. And honestly, I don't expect either to be stolen away. The odds are that it is a jungle Evelyn from Gambit and that you can take as long as you want for Ozone to, to pick the rest of your champions here. Uh, but there's actually a lot of interesting things coming through with these lineups as well. The, the Sona Steel, for example, is, is a contested pick as well that you talked about. Um, both teams actually won when they ran Sona. So you've just got a lot of high priority champions being taken away, just like this Varus being stolen away from Gensha. So in the bottom lane of Gambit, currently sitting in Ozone's back pocket with that Varus and the Sona. We'll have to see 
Most likely going to see Voidal trend towards that Zyra. It's what he's been doing all tournament long. He's only played those two uh, support champions. And you can see Genja scratching his head right now, definitely thinking about what they want to play. Is it going to be Cogmore? Is he going to go Misfortune? He has done it once already. He did that against uh, Fnatic. It didn't work out in that game. Mm -hmm. But it is a champion that he has immense amount of experience with. And the thing is, the bottom lane is fully revealed for Ozone. Gambit can lock in their duo lane fully and know what their counter pick is going to be and leave the mid lane there for last and let also, and also let Alex Itch counter pick. Just because they, they blind pick their top laner in jungle, Oh, uh, Gambit have now given themselves full control over the rest of the lanes here. Zyra, as you mentioned, yes, of course, is going to be that other support coming through. The Kog'Maw coming back into it as well. It's pretty comfortable picks here for Gambit. And they're coming into this knowing what they're facing. So it, it's got to be the right call for that. My question now, what does Dade lock in for his mid lane? Is he going to take Orianna? And if that is the case, how does Alex respond? I was going to suggest maybe a TF, as you've already highlighted, but we'll have to see how this pans out because, you know, Gambit's going to have this option to counter pick, and there we go. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a top lane Elise, maybe? Most likely. With Jungle Lee Sin. Most likely. We yeah. do see top lane Lee Sin once in a while. We haven't seen Looper play either of these champions, if I recall, yeah. so far this tournament. And of course, we've never seen Looper in competitive play before this tournament, so you never quite know. Uh, but. Basically, Ozone have now come in and locked in a heavy utility composition. Varus ultimate, Sona ultimate, Twisted Fate ganking around the map. It's a lot of stuns looking for picks. So I'm just going to go on a loop, and I love seeing Alex Hitch on, on Assassins. I'm not expecting this, but I would love to see the likes of a Kha'Zix against what is actually a very squishy lineup. And it's a champion that fell out of favor. We'll most likely see Orianna, but we'll see what he yeah. decides to go with. The problem with Kha'Zix is you need an area of effect team to set it up because you're very reset-based. You can't, like, burst one target and hope Kha'Zix works out. So instead, you get one of the age-old counter picks. This Kha'Zix had only been banned against the European squads, if I recall correctly. And Alex is a very good Kassadin. And when we consider how rough Dottie's laning phase has been, and you're giving Alex a champion who just has to get past the laning phase and then thrive, this is putting a lot of cards in the Alex Edge deck and saying, look, it's on you make it happen, and I think he's been set up here to do a very good job with that. I'm happy to see Alex on an Assassin. I do feel it's his yeah. strongest suit, and the one thing you've got to remember as well is the nightmares that Ozone are going to be having of Expecus Cassidy. When yeah. they were, you know, absolutely decimated by Fnatic's dual Assassin combination, and you've got, you know, very mobile, I mean, Eve can assassinate from the blind, you've got Aatrox that can dive in there, and if they do get collapsed upon, well, we'll buy some time. We've got Zyra for the knockout. And this is so, I think, really good from Gambit overall. I think they've done a much better job in Champion Select with this one. Because think back to the first win. They had Mata failed to ward properly for Diamond. And stuff got turned around. Now, to their credit, if Dot ever looks for a gank, his ultimate will reveal Evelyn, so he knows he won't be jumping into a trap. But that ultimate can also be counteracted by Alex that just teleport. So you've basically got more map mobility by Gambit, the chance of sneaking by sight wards from Ozone and making more plays, snowballing an early game lead, which we've sort of identified as, as a sort of a need here for Gambit, and then they're going to be in really good shape. Well, I definitely want to highlight for both of these teams that early game is important because yeah. we've seen both of them falling behind. I mean, uh, Gambit were dead to rights in the first 15 minutes of that matchup against Vulcan, and because of a counter-baron play, they were able to bring themselves back in. It's, I don't feel like they can afford to have that same... Neither of these teams can afford to have that same sort of start to this matchup because with so much on the line, with so much more pressure on your back, this is the game that decides. There are no yeah. more chances. Win here or go home. Exactly. It's win here or go home, and neither of these teams are really known for giving away advantages once they've built up a real lead. Again, these guys went one and one throughout the group stage. The team that got that first lead was the team that won the game. Convincingly, I might add, with very few mistakes on both sides. These guys have gotten comeback wins, but they've never given a game away. So I think you're right that the beginning of this game matters a lot. The first 10 minutes is incredibly important. And what's going to be fun to watch, though, is that Dandy on Lee Sin can make moves early on. Evelyn has to capitalize on his lane's crowd control to make stuff happen. So there's a bit of a mismatch there, actually. Well, we'll see how it works out for them. There is a fair amount of crowd control. Knock up and slow from Aatrox. Root from Zyra, of course. And of course, if Diamond is able to read Dandy's movements and counter gank, it can work in their favor. Uh, there is a 
peripheral plus power plus problem uh, in IMPS uh, computer right now. You can see the referees and the technicians busy working on it. So we do have a very brief pause before we get into this tiebreaker. And we talked about it, Group B. There was enough European teams present to give us this tiebreaker match. So plus, plus one on our total number of games. Plus one. We're casting three today. It's going to be awesome. And, and I, I like looking at these two lineups because they function in oddly similar ways. I, I think I would characterize both of them as sort of pick compositions where you're, you're trying to find some kind of opening. It's just sort of, uh, or at least, you know, you're trying to split up your opponents and then make things happen. So Cassidy, right, such a good duelist, has teleport to help teammates out, can split push constantly and teleport to a team fight. And there's really no good duelist to deal with Alex such as Cassidy. And so it, Gambit actually, if Alex gets out of the laning phase successfully, Gambit puts a lot of pressure on Ozone. But on the same side, Ozone has a lot of ways to force lopsided engagements. They've got the Twist of Fate Ultimate. They've got Lee Sin coming in very early on. You've got Varus and Sona with crowd control. Both these guys can make things happen at a moment's notice and then hope that they don't get countered on quickly. Gambit get locked up. They're going to be in trouble. So we are into the tiebreaker, ladies and gentlemen. This is genuinely the last game here in Group B. And the winner will be advancing to the quarterfinals and having a shot at the Summoner's Cup. As it stands, Dade is going to go head-to-head -head against Alex Session. Alex on Cassidy, and a known counterpick to Twisted Fate. This should be a lane that he should be comfortable with, but we'll keep our eyes on his CS as the game progresses. And I always like talking about the 2v1 mid lanes because it doesn't really hold down the mid lane. We saw Ozone 2v1 Peke's Cassidy and said, yeah, you got less minion kills, um, but you you still got full experience. You got to teleport around the map and make plays, which is all that Cassidy really wants to do. So he just, Alex sitting here with a Doran shield, happy to fight against Wizard Fate, won't get pushed out. Okay, fine. But I want to point out Looper's item build as well. He's actually looking for what I believe to be a 1v1 matchup. He's gone with the Flask, which does not have good combat stats to survive a 3v1 dive. Looper's trying to be safe and have a more secure lane. And we'll see if they can find that secure lane. There's no, what we've come to call the Ozone Ward. It's basically the ward that reveals where the lanes are going if you place it by basically the inner turret on the top or bottom lane. So both of these teams are going to have to do their best guesswork. And as it stands, Gambit have thrown their duo lane up top. I also want to highlight the fact that Genja has started with a Doran's Blade in this matchup. He went Doran Shield on Varus in the previous game. So we may be seeing maybe a more standard start here. Yeah, this is confidence in Gambit that they're finding the right matchup for themselves, that they're getting the 2v1. Because Sona Varus has a heck of a lot of poke, and there's no sustain in that lane for Gambit. Going Doran's Blade means he thinks he's not going to fight those guys. because He's happy to go Doran's Shield when he thinks he is going to do that. And Gambit, I think, have actually won that lane game unless uh, Ozone does something crazy here. So it's, it's the 2v1 in the bottom lane, and Darian is defending. It's the 2v1 top lane with Looper defending and already some early ward control for Gambit to make sure they don't get surprised by Dandy's Lee Sin. Well, we'll see how it works out for them. Darian has secured himself that wolf camp, will be recalling to heal up, and then moving his way down to, most likely this bottom half of the map, has actually cancelled the recall, and is now moving his way towards mid lane, in fact. Yeah. Right, gonna be Wraith camp, jumps over the wall. So Darian is turning himself into a jungler, relying on that uh, blood well that blood price to keep himself topped up on HP. This is incredibly smart by Gambit. It's a really good play. Darius taking a bit of damage here. He should be all right. But at the end of the day, look how much that bottom lane has been frozen out by the dual lane of Ozone. It's just now reaching the turret. Now, it does reach early, actually. This experience is going to waste right now by Darien. He's not getting any of this. But what's, what's worth remembering about this it is also some money that's kind of trading hands here. Because Mod has been forced to pink ward the, the gank path to look for an Evelyn, whereas a much cheaper green ward's been used by Voidal to make sure that Dandy's not coming up. Well, see how it works out for them. There's a very large minion wave against Gambit's mid lane tower as well. Alex is doing the best he can to farm up under tower. Five CS behind already, as we do see now Darian making his way to this bottom lane. The cannon minion does look like it is already down, and he's going to be in range for at least a good number of these caster minions. He's got a nine CS to three advantage as well as getting much closer to level 3. So he's got a full level over Looper, but the last hitting of Looper should be a little easier thanks to those ranged auto attacks. And I actually like to point out as well that Ozone pushed that, that lane a little bit faster than you would otherwise need to. You can push it slower and push with a cannon minion, as you see right here with Gambit. But of course, that gave Dandy enough time to show up and defend this lane. Whereas for Ozone, they got a lot of those minions to die to the turret before Darien showed up. So Ozone realizing how slow Darien was showing, 
denied some experience there. It's also something that we've seen Vulcan doing to Ozone earlier today as well. Yep. It was Looper that fell prey to that little uh, tactic, as it were, and managing to incorporate in their early game. So no massive advantages across the board here. Five CS in the lead is Darien. We do see it's basically evened out by about six CS in the mid lane as Dade's Twisted Fate is naturally going to pull ahead. But this tower in the bottom lane has taken a lot of damage. It's down to below half health. And we see Diamond setting up in the mid lane. We do see Pick a Card has been used. Here comes Diamond. He's going to get some hate spikes down. There is no Pick a Card available. So now he's going to get out cleaning. Gold Card catches Alex. Ooh. He's actually going to flash the Sonic Wave. Very, very scared of the burst. And damage that could come down from Dandy and Dade. But that now opens up a huge window because there's five minutes without teleport now for Alex, as well as two levels until he gets Rift Walk back. Dade Dandy can easily get another gank there and put heavy damage onto Alex, potentially kill him, but at least force him out of lane. Flash plus Ignite is available for Dade, so we'll see if he decides to use this one. And I keep topping himself up with those blue cards in the mid lane and continues to control this lane up, pushing it into Kassadin as much as possible. Farming under the tower is a little bit easier thanks to that nether blade, but still taking a lot of harass from Dade without reply. So this is going to be Alex forced to recall back. What's interesting though is there's that turret going down. The 2v1 is much more successful, but Dandy's looking for the top lane, spotted by a ward, and Diamond already recalled. So Voidus goes down. Here comes Looper. He's ignited Voidal. Voidal's going to at least flash away. It's a successful gank. A lot of damage being applied to Dandy. We do see that Voidal gets out cleaning, but Ignite Burn for Looper, flash down for Voidal. So that's two flashes down for Gambit in the early game. So some pretty successful ganks here by Dandy. Ultimately, Looper did not quite land the cocoon, though that is what Voidal had flashed. But it still means that there are openings now for Ozone. And remember that Dade is about to hit level 6. This wave will give him Destiny the ability to force one of those flashless lanes into death. Well, let's see if he can make it work for him. Those first couple of Destinies really so impactful on the tempo of Twisted Fate's mid-game. He's already got himself a 20 CS advantage. Zoki top lane. He'll start to recall right now. He does have it available, and Alex is doing the best that he can, and he talks about this. If Kassadin can make it out of the laning phase, he can do well. Imp has already rotated to the mid lane, because of course that tower is down in the bottom, and they're now going to set their sights on this mid-outer turret. Without Alex there to defend it, I'm going to try to uh, close in, but there's going to be a lot of damage being applied. There's one weakness to this lane rotation, though, is that they've actually left Darien alone to farm and shove down. So he's at 31-something minions, and Darien has the potential to fully carry a game as an Aatrox. And Ozon has to be careful that they can still control Dragon as well as still control Darien, who is going to be a scary force and one of the major damage threats on this Gambit lineup. And I definitely want to highlight the build that he used against Mineski while playing Aatrox. After going Blade of the Ruined King, he ended up, uh, sorry, uh, Ravenous Hydra rather, mm -hmm. he picked himself up a Gwinzu's Rage Blade. So really just synergizing with everything else that Aatrox uh, synergizes with. <laughs> Level 6 right now does have Massacre available. So if a fight were to break out, it's a lot of attack speed. Now it's unfortunate for Gambit. Uh, as well, when we kind of look at these champions, that they didn't take down this turret because it's going to be a clean 1-0 turret lead for Ozone. Gambit can't send their dual lane top without giving away Dragon. So instead, they've sent their dual lane mid somewhere else that they can put some pressure on the map and leaving Alex top lane, who's still got teleport available. So even though a bunch of crazy things happened to Ozone's credit early on, Gambit have the map mobility advantage over Dragon if Looper stays up here. Well, we do see uh, Alex getting jumped on Cocoon Lance. They trade some poke back and forth. And at the end of it, we do see Looper coming up a little bit ahead. He does have some potions and that flask to rely on, as well as those spidlings to help give himself some HP back. And he should be okay in that lane. Alex also doing the best he can once again to continue CSing. Now, Genji and Voidal set their sights on Dide. I'm going to try and decline his amount of CS, but thanks to those wild cards, he's doing a good job. But I actually like this this lane assignment by Gambit, because Voidal plus Diamond can give them a kill on the Dada if Dandy doesn't turn this gank around. He's looking for the top lane, though. It's bad for Alex. Gold, gold card does land into a cocoon immediately. Alex gets dropped down. First blood goes to Looper. Dade and Looper just chaining that CC so incredibly well. And of course, right there, the ulti also revealed Diamond's location. They know he's on the top side of the map. Uh, Ozone actually started pinging out the dragon, saying we should try to get control over this one. That top lane kill, of course, very well executed. Good job chaining their crowd controls at the right times to pick up this kill. And suddenly, Gambit are got a little bit less of a leg to stand on. And as it stands, Ozone now stacked up the numbers in the mid lane. They already have a tower advantage, and Ozone 
are going to try to take down this Tower of Gambit. Genjin Voidal do have a little bit of AoE, so they can throw out their spam to try and defend it, but as it stands, Ozone back off, not willing to risk sticking around, knowing that at a moment's notice, Diamond Prox could actually jump on it. Yeah, it's definitely a scary thing right here, and I want to just keep track of where Vision Wards actually are for Ozone, because last time they lost to an Evelyn, they weren't respecting it enough, and Diamond got in some really good sort of free ganks from Fog of War, and right now there's really only one. It's only spotting the left-hand side of mid. Any other gank path that Diamond goes for will succeed and be invisible. Well, Imp gets caught out, and here comes Dade from the side. Instant Void Ooze there from Genja to slow the path down from Dade. He does have those boots of speed on his back pocket, so he only needs to move a little bit quicker. Now, Teleport is available, but there's no wards in the river here for Gambit. I think they're going to be aware the Dragon's going on, but if they respond, it will be too late, and yep. Ozen should secure this one uncontested. Very well done. Well controlled. In fact, there are actually pings in the top jungle saying Diamond is up here, and they pinged that without him really walking through a ward. They just knew where Diamond was headed. They said, okay, the jungle's on the wrong side of the map. Uh, Alex can't get out of range of Cocoon in time to teleport into the fight, and so Looper could have stopped him. Just a well-controlled game. That is, that is Ozone. They know what's available on the map and are very good at taking riskless objectives, saying, yep, you cannot stop Dragon. We have more members than you. This will be fine. Over and over again, that is how Ozone builds the lead. The rotations are good. Their lane assignments have actually been pretty remarkable as well. Well, one tower, one Dragon. Bunch of CS and two and a half thousand gold in favor of Ozone right now. Genja, 96 CS on the board. He is ahead of him. However, he hasn't gone back to spend any of that money just yet. He's finished off his Berserker's Greaves and Double Doran, so a little bit behind the, you know, BF Sword and Vamp Scepter that Imp is currently built up. I'd we'll like to see where he prioritizes. He's sitting in about 13, 1400 gold in his back pocket. Yep, Imp is going to spike first in this game, which is which is great for Ozen because mid game is going to be the important part here. Darian's going to get out of this one. Okay, so the mid game is going to be better for Ozone. A wasted TF ultimate, not that scary. Imp will have enough to complete his uh, Bloodthirster in about 600 gold, whereas Genja's got a while to wait till he finishes any major items. So you're going to see a lot of control here for Ozone, and they'll likely snowball more of a lead here. As long as Genja has that mana available, he seems to be keeping Imp at least at arm's length. Using that bio arcane barrage and getting some good damage down, Dandy is waiting in the wings. He's hanging out in the bush, just looking to see Flash Crescendo could be the way into this fight if Genja and Voidal just overstep past that uh, safety line. And we'll see, of course, Dandy happy to wait around. The pink ward control is there. And now look actually at the vision ward control for Ozen as well. They've got one top lane. They've got a couple near mid. They've got one near the dragon as well. There's many less opportunities for Diamond. Diamond can run around and farm minions. And to his credit, he's farming really strongly. But he won't have any pressure on the lanes. So they get a root down onto Mata and Dandy. Chain of Corruption is going to lock Genja in place so he can't apply damage to the squishy targets. Imp is going to be able to continue to land down the damage on Genja. He's forced out of the fight. And a little bit of miscommunication there. Agony's Embrace was thrown down by Diamond, but there's not enough damage on the Ozo members. Unfortunately, no. The Zyra ult came across. They tried to make that happen, but no, there aren't people here. Daring the well cut out. He's going to use that Dark Fight to get out. Piercing Arrow is going to connect onto Diamond. And now Ozone have got so much HP to work with. They're going to stick on that mid outer turret. They're going to be able to secure this one as Gambit took too much poke and this is exactly what happened to Gambit when they lost to Ozone in their second game. Yeah, and Ozone are really just getting there first over and over again. They made the they, they forced the issue in the mid lane. Uh, again, a low risk issue, but it, they made it happen saying we've got the numbers advantage. We know that Diamond is not flanking us, so the fight is ours. Alex still needs to power up before he's useful in this game. Has a catalyst. All right, he's got some mana. That's nice, but he's still waiting on levels. He's still waiting on items. The Gambit power spike is still not here. Ozone are still clawing farther and farther ahead with this mid game lead. Two and a half thousand gold approaching 3,000. At this point in the matchup, Dada is going to be able to eventually pick up that blue buff, as Alex will do the same. This will allow him to at least fill up that tier a little bit more efficiently. You did see Looper was trying to steal it away, but honestly, realizing he was behind enemy lines without support, he got out clean. Alex getting closer to level 11, so that Rift Walk is going to hit a little bit harder. And as it stands, Gambit... I guess they're trying to just hit the pause button right now. Yes. They're trying to farm this one up, trying to 
get to an item position and then deciding to fight. Yes, and their split pushers are fairly safe. We did see a gank work on Alex Itch. That was the first blood. All right, good job there by Ozone. But generally speaking, it's pretty easy for Darian to run away. He's got move blocks, he's got slows, he's even got the revive passive. They sent Alex Itch bottom because he wanted to control this, but Looper finds Alex. Oh, that's a lot of damage. Destiny is available. We do see the repel coming in from Looper. He's going to continue trying to focus down. Flash is up. Alex not going to need it. Rift walks out and really testing the limits of that Sonic Wave. Yeah, ultimately, Cassidy's a pretty good matchup against Elise if TF doesn't show up. You take less magic damage from the passive, which is really all that Elise does right here. And you've actually got more mobility as Cassidy. In. Alex will still be okay to run this one as long as he doesn't get surprised. I want to keep looking back at these wards though. It's still about how well is Diamond's Evelyn controlled. Diamond is stuck here just farming his jungle over and over, which is giving him some gold golden experience. But the vision ward control is preventing any ganks at all. It's just Gambit forced to pause and hope to outgold their opposition. All right, we'll see if it can work out for them. Ozone now moving their way towards this bottom half of the map. There's a minute to go until the dragon is up. So look at all of these wards in the river towards that objective. There's not enough members of Gambit here to defend this tower in a four-man Ozone. He's going to be able to apply a lot of damage into this inner bottom lane tower. Imp and Mata just landing auto attack after auto attack. We do see Agony's Embrace going in. That's a great strangle force. Going to knock up nobody actually from Ozone as they manage to get out. Now Voidal kick back into the fight. The rest of Gambit are untouched though. This is the second kill for Gambit. But they now turn their focus onto him. This is going to be a triple kill for Genji. In actual fact, Alex secures it. They only lost their support. Ozone focusing, not the damage dealers. Without hesitation, these guys just went in for that one. Amazing initiation right there. Genja was untouched off on the side, just raining down punishment with that phage first build. You've got to watch out though. Diamond and Co are looking for Looper. Oh, that is a dead Looper. Now they jump onto Dade. Flash has been burned. Diamond Prox is thinking about the dive. He continues to land the poke. Genja with max range by Arcane. He lands the gold card into Alex. While this is going on, this is the second tower that Darian's going to take. Exactly. He has been untouched there. Dade was not available for that fight on the right-hand side of the map, and Gambit knew about it. They saw Dade recall and leave that top lane knowing it's a four on four an untouched darian what a good fight there gambit finding the mid game battle they needed they find themselves so many kills two towers a dragon we've got a saying when you watch the eu lcs that if you give gambit a finger they'll take your whole arm and that is exactly what they just did in this fight that was incredible just landing all the area of effect. It actually reminds me of a game back in the spring split of Marn versus CLG. Watch this engage. Three people by the Evelyn, the ulti from the Zyra, and the slow in there from Kassin. It's a lot of early damage, and now look at Genja. Has a lot of low health targets that he can freely attack here. And keep in mind that by hitting three targets with Diamond's ulti, he gets a big shield out of that one, absorbed a lot of the early punishment, and let his team follow through afterwards. Gambit initiating is actually what their comp is really about with an Evelyn. They're the ones to force the issue because they can make those fights work. Yeah, and even though that knockup from Voidal's Strangle Force didn't catch anyone, just the zone presence that yep. it had simply forced Ozone to split up and basically straggle for targets. Now, Genja, Trinity Force is completed on Cogmore. He's got those double Dorans as Ozone and I'm stacking up in this top lane. Darian is in a lot of trouble, but Gambit are trying to respond. We'll see if they decide to dive before the rest of Gambit can get here. It's going to be an interesting one right here. Darian is pretty much safe to defend this one. Of course, Diamond gets revealed. Pretty much they're not just able to push. Darian's actually jumping in, does get the knockup onto Dandy, realizing that he's got the support on the rest of his team. Cocoon goes out from Looper, almost catching Diamond Prox as he did walk across that pink ward, but he gets out cleanly. Now, Alex has his Rod of Ages completed. He continues to split push, and he's not used his teleport just yet. He still has not had to burn this at all. There's no one even trying to stop Alex here. No one is looking to defend this turret whatsoever. Ozone can try to force a play somewhere else, but thing is, without ward control, they can't bait Baron. Gambit sees them. Well, they're going to play the Baron game with the European team. They're going to be aware of how this works. 
They are going to stick around and remember the teleport can come in. Now Darian's caught out. That's a lot of mobility. They dive onto him. Dragon's Rage comes up. His Bloodwell is available. Hasn't been popped yet. That's Destiny into Gold Card. Now the Hex Trinker Shield will wear off by the time he respawns. Darian failed flashes into a face plant. Alexic is now alone, trying to single out Mata in the background. Voidal gets caught up by the Gold Card. Strangle Force has not been used because it's not available in the background. Genja is left alone. Alex has got a double kill onto both Lysian and Sona. Now he's running away for his life. Rift walks out clearly. They've traded one for two in a very sloppy fight all over the place. Those kills were incredibly close right there. I can't believe Voidal lived either, but Diamond's getting chased by Looper. This would be a close battle. The question is, can the crowd control land? Diamond gets a lot oh. of damage. He sidesteps out of the way of the cocoon. He may actually want to return, decides against it, backs away to his tower, and Genja is going to secure that red buff. A two for one after Darian was caught by Ozone. They burned a lot of cooldowns for that one, Ozone. They got a little bit out of position and the re-engage came across. Look at that fight. So they burn a lot here for Diamond. The Lee Sin kick, the ult as well from Twisted Fate, and this puts a really good position now for Gambit. Watch them pile in. Look how easy it is to land the rest of the CC. It separates the team in half, letting Alex and Diamond put free damage here on Amada and Imp. You've got Dandy at no health either. Genja actually solos people off on the right-hand side of the map as well. He's able to survive that fight cleanly. Basically, Ozone aren't able to fight as a group. The individual plays by Gambit. Let them separate and pick up kills there in that battle. Too much damage from too many assassins paying dividends here for Gambit. And now 7-3 up in kills. They now have a 3,000 gold lead. And Alex is just going to return himself back to that bottom lane. Going to try and push down the tower as best he can. The rest of the Gambit team are now actually stacking up in this mid lane. But Darian, without his blood well, they may want to play a little passive until that's available again. Get that revive up and running and then pick another fight, knowing that he can come back to life, be a nuisance, put more damage down. And I'm actually glad you mentioned the blood well there because it speaks to an interesting quirk with Gambit's sort of lineup. Everyone on this roster, literally all five members are damage threats. Okay, support Zyra not a ton, but with plans and time, all of these guys deal real damage in a team fight. So if you dive the Kog'Maw, the rest are still hitting you. But even though they're not real tanks, the, the Evelyn and the Aatrox, they're deceptively tanking. You've got the Evelyn ulti shield per target hit. You've got the Blood Well and the Life Steal on hit from the Aatrox. So Gambit crush you while not really dying that fast. It's a really cool comp. Well, we'll see if it works out for them. Alex Hitch is well aware of Dali taking out this ward. Remember that of these team's seven kills, he's got been involved in seven of them. They trade back and forth. There's a lot of HP on Alex though, so definitely coming out ahead in that situation. The rest of the team has come to join him in this bottom lane, and the pink ward war is in full effect as this is just pinks for pinks. And Diamond's actually hiding in the corner where this all happens. The plans from Voida will keep him pretty much safe here as he sweeps it away. Uh-oh, this could be risky. Dade wants to look for something here. Yeah, there's no Aatrox. Aatrox is up in the top lane. The question is, where is Dade going? We'll have to keep an eye on the gate once Twisted Fate lands. It actually fizzles. He decides not to use it. But cooldown blown. Gambit will be happy with that, especially with Dragon coming up. And that's a good play by Gambit to make sure they were all grouped up there. Dottie did not have the ability to hardcore initiate without dying immediately afterwards. He went for a fast Abyssal Scepter and Mercury Treads. He went for a build that would let him survive and actually dual cast it in a 1v1, not hardcore engage Zonius for his team and kind of show back up. Because Dottie went for an alternate sort of tanky build, he couldn't just jump in and start the fight which is a bit of a risk when you consider the fact that Darian got a Hex Drinker, which is fine, it's taking us and damage. And Alex Itch is just getting Roa, which is taking us and damage. And, and it plays right into what these champions want to do. Well, we'll see if it works out for them. As it stands, Dragon is alive. And do you see Diamond Prox eats a Sonic Wave from Dandy. Dandy follows this one in. He does get silenced up though, so not going to be able to deal more damage as Diamond gets a massive shield from Agony's Embrace. Stranglethorns in the background has already been thrown down from Voidal, and this is another one of his mixed fights. Alex is going to get one. Both supports are down as Alex tries to focus off the backline. Dandy, Looper, and Dade sticking towards the Dragon as Imp was able to get away. They've traded two, uh, one one for one in that fight. If there was a little bit more ward coverage by Gambit, they could have chased down Imp because there is no way the rest of Ozone could have helped the Varus. An AD carry getting separated is the worst thing that can happen to a team right here. So, okay, yeah, G Diamond took a bunch of damage, had to tank it out. But it's Gambit, in a way, won that fight by outpositioning Ozone afterwards. It was just unfortunate their health bars weren't high enough to capitalize with a lot more after it. Well, what Ozone are going to have to be aware of is in these fights right now, it's both times they've actually been able to jump onto somebody, but haven't been able to close it out effectively. It's something that they're going to have to 
rectify in this mid game if they want to become more of a threat. Alex once again continues pushing down the wave as the rest of Gambit are going to secure themselves their dragon here right now and just extend that gold beat that they currently have. They need to wait for Diamond though because Dandy could always steal this away. He's got the reveal as well. Now do they wait for the Q to time out? Flash is available for Dandy. He can always W over and go for it. He's going to W over. The Flash is available. Flash is out. Now Darian has thrown down the Massacre. It's going to get a little bit of damage, but Dragon was secured, and I think trading that for the Flash of Dandy plus Massacre cooldown, and Gambit are going to be very happy with this trade. Alex continues to farm up. He now has a 30 CS advantage over Dardy's Twisted Fate, and they pick up the third tower of the game to go with that Dragon they just secured. Great play there, Alex H. You give him a playmaker, and he's going to make the plays 6 1 and 2, doing everything right. 9,000 gold total he's earned. He's about a quarter of his team's gold. Dandy makes a play in a Voidal, though. He's going to kick Voidal back. Here yeah, comes Mada and Imp in the background. You see Diamond Proc zoning them out. This is basically 1v2. That is home guard Alexic coming in. He's picked up two quick kills as Dardy and Dandy are sitting on the sideline. Here yeah, comes Darian though. He gets a knockup. He secures the third kill of the fight for Gambit. All they've cost was a Voidal. Now we see Alex with the Rift Hook in. He's going to eat a gold card, but Dardy's been silenced. And Darian and Alex should be able to close this one out. Alex will get the kill credit thanks to the damage he's putting down. And not even going to make it to the tower. And that is a 4 for 1. Convincing team fight win for Gambit and still 100% kill participation for Alex Hitch's Cassidy. And Ozone are not respecting the teleport. There's the play. They've got what they think is a numbers advantage, but they don't. Diamond separates the back line, and here comes Alex. The burst is so high from a mid game Cassidy. Once you're at level 13, you just do that much damage. The re-engage comes in. And again, it's in the first game, it was not respecting Evelyn. Now it's not respecting the teleport. Well, in this particular matchup, Alex Hitch using a very cheeky teleport to a Zyra plant in that team fight. A very nice play, and those home guard boots really allowing him to just cross the battlefield at a moment's notice. Once again, Alex returns to the split pushing game. 9-1-3, the one thing Gammon have to be very aware of. If Alex is the target that goes down, if he is caught by a Dragon Rage into a Cocoon, Crescendo, Chain of Corruption, all of that CC, that's where all of their team's, you know, kill gold has really gone. So yes. it's very much an all eggs in one basket, and this is a pretty big basket right now. It, yeah, and, and it's, it's like one big egg and three kind of smaller ones there. Just to sort of clarify the numbers, 10,000 gold on Alex itch, 9,000 on Genji is pretty good, but then it's only 7k on Darien. There is a pretty big drop-off after the two squishy targets kind of running around in the middle middle of the fight. So there is some real potential there for assassination. Dandy, Looper, Dade, Imp, they can all snipe one guy, and it is a concern here. Alex, though, realizing some of this, had already gotten Mercury Treads, is also going towards a Zonia's Hourglass to help guarantee he doesn't get killed too fast. So I think Gambit are covering their bases pretty well. They've got a 5,000 gold lead, and now, it's Gambit with control, and I want to see what they do with it. Well, we see uh, Gambit setting up around the Baron Pit right now, getting some wards down, clearing out the Ozone wards. I want to highlight the fact that Looper has gone for a Rylai's Crystal Scepter, going for that HP. He's got a Negatron Cloak, plus more HP and penetration from the Haunted Guys. You know, in conjunction with the Abyssal Scepter that we see Dade picking up, that's three defensive items against this all-damage Gambit team. Now, we do see that... Uh, 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 Seraph's Embrace has been completed for Alex Hitch. It is fully stacked up and he's working his way towards the Hourglass. So, as if it wasn't difficult enough to lock him down, it now becomes incrementally more difficult to actually kill him. Oh, it absolutely is. This is just going to be... Uh, I feel like it's going to continue to be an Alex Hitch field day unless he massively misplays. And you'll notice the sort of gameplay that Gambit are going for is they're actually playing around their cooldowns very, very well. Despite the fact that they're up 12 kills to five, never mind, they're going in on him. Oh, Imp's in trouble. Take a look at that. Agony's Embrace comes down. They're leaving the kill for Alex Hitch. He oh. even Rift walks the Chain of Corruption. Massive play. And that's Alex making, picking up his 10th kill of the game. I was literally about to say that Gambit aren't taking a lot of aggressive moves there. They're playing between their cooldowns. But when you got a free kill like that, you go back to the old Gambit style of see hero, see hero kill hero. And 5v4, they can take at least a turret off of this. Well, they're going to pick up their fourth tower of the game. That is now all outer towers down. 15 seconds left on the clock before Imp is alive. And Gambit toying with the idea of mid lane. But you hear the fallback ping. They're saying, let's back off, let's play it a bit safer, get away, and here's a replay of that mid-kill. And it's just easy crowd control here. They stack the slows together. Diamond knows that the Varus ult is available, and he doesn't want to get rooted in place. So let's Alex go for it. Here's the play. Sees the cast animation, sees it come out. Oh. Just 
jukes it out. I like that play from Alex. And of course, the rotation doesn't come in time for Ozum. Those kills come so fast from these assassins. And we see that uh, Sorcerer shoes plus the movement speed that Diamond Prox gets with that Evelyn just closing the gap too quickly. And we'll have to see how how Ozone respond to this because we don't see a number of pink wards anywhere other than sort of the entrances to that mid lane tower area. We do see Dandy's running around with an Oracle's Elixir, but I feel like if you need to spot Diamond with an Oracle's, it's already too late. Well, the problem is Ozone has been pink warding. That's kind of been the issue the whole time. There's Diamond in the top lane. Oh, we do see Darian. He manages to get away from the Sonic Wave. He does have Blood Well available, so he's going to get popped into his passive. The rest of Gambit are trying to respond. Is now Dandy is running away. Darian has managed to survive. Sonic Wave is oh. up. Dandy jukes backwards. Here comes Alex with a Rift Walk, though, and Genja continues to try to get in range. Darian is alive, though. Genja is probably going to be able to pick this one up. Kill credit goes to Genja. Assist to Kassadin, but you got to give props to Dandy for at least planning that almost escape. That was a cute move at the end right there. I want to see if Gambit keeps chasing. He actually tried a move that would have worked about a year ago, where you put a ward down and turrets would target wards. They no longer do that, but he was trying to tank a little bit of damage and get out. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. Some good moves in general. Uh, but yeah, you sort of look back at, at this game and Ozone, yeah, they're trying to pick off individual targets, but those individual targets are no longer really killable. You can pop Darian's Bloodwell. Okay. <laughs> you can pop the, uh, the Evelyn ultimate and let her run away really fast with the giant shield, and it's probably not going to work well for you either. And Alex Hitch, of course, we've seen him get away from this one. So Gambit are playing around the TF Lee Sin Elise really, really, really well. And now with teleport back up for Alex, he can split the bottom lane and continue to stretch out Ozone's lineup. Now one of the things that Gambit are going to know very, very well, all the champions that Ozone are playing, these are main champions for Gambit. They've played them all. If they're going to yeah. know how to deal with them, how to run rings around, how to avoid them, they've thought about it. They, they know the weaknesses of these champions and it, it's showing in every single one of these team fights that Ozone has started. Gambit has come out of hate. I feel like uh, uh, Gambit's probably played this exact lineup at some point before, like literally all five. So I, I completely agree with your point that these guys are playing pretty much from home. Whereas Kassadin, not that common in Korea. Kog'Maw, we haven't seen at all until this tournament. Aatrox, only really seen in Europe for the most part. Um, or at least, you know, not in China. So it's, it's Gambit playing totally with home turf. We talked about how well could Ozone adapt. Dade is main champion, has got it getting nerfed out, not finding anything new. And they're playing just a strategy that Gambit knows so well, but it's not the same on the other side. Ozone are trying to stop the bleeding now, but it's been moves made by Gambit over and over. Well, let's see how well they handle their position right now. Genja once again securing that red buff for himself. Bloodthirster is getting much more stacked up. He's gone for those distortion boots once again. We're going to see... Lower cooldowns on his flash, being able to avoid the CC that Ozone wants to be putting down. And Gambit with a 9,000 gold lead. Deathfire Grasp completed for Diamond Prox. And we'll see them starting to group up. Voil clearing up wards around Baron Pit. And if there's one thing that you can do as a European team, is play the Baron card. Because if anyone's done their research, you know how Baron-centric the EU gameplay is. And right now, Gambit trying to almost bait this fight. And the thing is, Gambit, I think, have done a better job of ward control, which is, of course, what you need when you do a Baron dance. But think back to how much money Mata has had to spend on pink wards, and compared to how relatively few Gambit has bought, and you actually mentioned how hard it would be for Oracles to spot the Elise roaming around. They had been putting pink wards down. The problem is, wardle has been wearing an Oracles for a while now and constantly sweeping them away. And unlike Sightstone wards that you can refresh and just not really pay anything, those Vision wards cost 125 apiece, and there have been a lot of them bought by this Ozone lineup. So even though the gold lead is 8,500, in terms of actual items and inventory, it's much higher because there's been a, a tax placed upon Ozone just because Evelyn exists. Well, let's see how well Gambit can continue to make advantage of it. As it stands, 0-1-9 on Diamond's Evelyn. If nothing else, he's played the perfect initiator here for Gambit. Every time a fight has erupted, that ultimate has come down, that massive shield has happened, and Diamond has basically actually just run in and run out because the rest of Gambit have just cleaned up. Aatrox has done the damage, Kassan has done the damage. Gambit can force a move now. They just spotted Imp in the bottom lane because Alex forced him there. Gambit have ward control. They can force a battle here at Baron. Genja, Darian, Diamond Prox, they've jumped onto Baron. There's a million pings on that mini-map. Ozone are aware of this. They're trying to respond. Now, Destiny is available here from Dade if they want to get Gambit the staying. But Destiny has been popped. We'll see how Dade rolls with this one. Teleport is available for Alex. The question is, what time does he 
can come he in. Got it. The question is now, we do see a steal from Dandy. That has been enough, but the question is at what cost? The first victim of the fight is Dale. Is now Genja, full HP, Voidal, still alive in the background. We do see Dandy securing a kill onto Diamond Prox. Genja, still untouched. Dandy jumps back in. This is a triple kill. Now Genja's the last target. He's doing the best he can to pick up kills. A captain surprise available. This is an uh, almost ace for Ozone and the Baron. A, Have they just pulled a Vulcan? A four for one. I was surprised that Gambit stayed for that fight. They had deep ward coverage. They knew that Ozum was coming in, and they said, all right, you, you can do two things. You either get there to Baron early, and you fight for it, but Alex teleported late, or you get the heck out of there and let Alex kill a free turret, and Gambit did neither. Alex teleported in late, was not there for the start of the fight. The Baron got stolen before Alex dealt any damage, and he didn't even get the turret for it either. Ozone get a huge amount of objectives off that fight. Inhibitor is exposed. Four members of Ozone with the tower. Here's a replay of the fight. Talk me through this. Teleport comes in late, Voidal forced back, and the ulti only hits one man. The initiation from Darien is great. It's a really nice opening, but Alex is forced to Zonia's out early and just can't make the same plays. Genja is forced to try to hit the right target and just keeps spreading his damage apart. Look how low Mata gets. Look how low Looper gets. Genja never finds someone to actually finish off too many low health bars. And that is because Alex came in late, did not get to put down early burst, and was not able to help chase down kills. Not a good fight for Genja. And you have to give props to Mata. He managed to get the crescendo onto Genja in the pit, prevented him getting those auto attacks down with the Bloodthirster Trinity Force and his Bio Arcane. Maybe, maybe those couple of auto attacks could have turned it around. Yes. A minute on the clock now for Dragon to respawn and look at all these pink wards on the map now. After that Baron, the gold that's just been secured, plus the power spike that Ozone have. His teams are playing for their lives. Remember, the winner of this game goes to quarterfinals. The loser does not. And Ozone have just been given a second lease on life. 2.8 thousand gold now separates these teams. Gambit need to keep their head in this one though because by all rights, I think they are still ahead if Baron buff times out here. Six to four in turrets though. Ozone have now gotten three turret kills at least off of that Baron buff so far. Yes, they are very well back in this game. They've got 30 seconds left on Baron buff. Sorry, 30 seconds till Dragon comes up and a minute and a half on the Baron buff. You will see this score get closer and closer before that buff times out. Gamut needs to wait and fight when it's gone. Now, once again, want to highlight a slightly different old oddball itemization here from Dade. Not only has he got the Abyssal Scepter, Lichbane TF, he's picked up a Magi Soul Stealer as well. After wow. going down in that previous Baron fight, this is an all or nothing item if ever I've seen one. And in a game that means this much, that counts this much, that could be game changing if it manages to get those stacks, if he manages to get all that ability power, and that cooldown reduction if he manages to get all the way to 20. That is a surprising amount of confidence. I, I've i got to question that a little bit because power now matters a heck of a lot. I don't know if Ozone can force a whole lot more kills to stack that Magi's up, but we'll see if he proves me wrong. TF ult has been popped. Ozone just looked for the mid lane turret though. They wanted to make sure they didn't get flanked on their way in. Well, we do see Gate has been used. The rest of Ozone trying to get in range. Looper leading the charge here. They're now onto the inhibitor. It's getting dropped very, very quickly. If Dade gets some Lich Bane procs on, it's going to go even quicker. Now though, the rest of Gambit have been able to group up and force Ozone back. But remember that Ozone have that inhibitor, uh, the Baron buff available if a fight were to break out. That's a surprisingly gun-shy move there by Ozone. They had the ability to spread out, not get mass ulted by a Zyra, not get mass ulted by Elise, and that's Ozone saying, look, we'll just play it slow. We could have gotten an inhibitor, we probably could have actually won the team fight, but we'll make the safe play. We'll take the safe dragon, get the gold a little bit closer, lose our Baron buff, but have the confidence to just win it later on. We'll see if they can do it. it they lost a giant mini wave in the top lane, no one cleaned that up. There's some things they're leaving on the table. In fact, they gave up the blue buff as well from Gambit. So the Baron has pulled Ozone back into this game. There was a near 10,000 gold difference less than 10 minutes ago. And I think everybody that was watching anticipates Gambit to close this game out. But a risky Baron, uh, maybe not quite as risky as what we've seen elsewhere, but a risky Baron led to some amazing dandy plays. He got two kills in the fight and a steal has kept Ozone alive. The question is, who can dig deeper? Who's going to be able to fall back on their experience and their ability to close this game up? Because it's either team 
can yes. do it. Either team can do it. I just think Gambit has more to fall back on. They've got more damage threats. They've got an Aatrox who is going to be so stupidly hard to kill in a team fight. He's got basically a million magic discs. The actual number is 185, but he's sitting on 2900 health. He's sitting on extra uh, life coming back in with his W thanks to Spirit Visage. He's got the shield as well from the Maha of Malmortius. If Imp sits there hitting a frontliner over and over and over again, I feel like it's a difficult team fight for Ozone to win. I still think Gambit have the right players here and the right champions to make a fight work. Well, they have to make that fight work because Ozone right now trying to set one up. They continue to stay grouped together as a five-man unit. The Baron has worn off about a minute 20 before it respawns. And you can see that Gambit now, Gambit definitely slowed down the pace of this one. They are actually two towers behind thanks to that previous Baron play. And I imagine Gambit just looking for an opportunity. We do have Teleport back available for Alex though. And similarly, Ozone also slows his pace down a little bit. They go for the play here in mid! Oh, we do see a knock up there onto Dane. That's a crescendo, locking up the back line of Gambit. Dane is the first victim to fall. We do see the Zonia's Hourglass from Alex. The chain of corruption is spreading. Diamond Prox has fallen. Genja is untouched in the fight. Genja's jumping onto him. He's squashing him down. Lupin now trying to get backwards. The Force Pulse doesn't connect as Darian with a Bloodwell. It's going to be able to solo out him. Genja gets a massive, massive amount of damage. Lupin's oh, That is going to be a massive win for Gambit. The crowd erupts. The ace is secured and now Gambit are chasing down the base. They've got 30 seconds to go and enough health bars to make some headway into this one. Baron is up in 20 seconds. They might make the same risk. They could probably do it. They've also got minions to push down mid. It's up to them. 20 seconds on the clock. And remember, Bloodwell is still available for Darien. They've got the inhibitor turret five seconds before Matas respawns. The inhibitor is going to be secured and Gambit are going to back away. A massive turn once again. That was absolutely huge right there to quote you. <laughs> Gambit going to recall in time. They will not get spotted by anything else. Dane realizes, you know, I might have got confident there. I'm going to sell that Magi's real quick. I don't think that was worth it. That is a massive, massive change. No more ability power from that particular item. And all of a sudden, Gambit now, with the super minions in the mid lane, they've got a 5,000 gold advantage. The question is, what do they do from here? Where do they go? They could push down the lanes. They could once again make a play on Baron. But it's just a ticking time bomb for them. So I think a real Baron play is not the right idea for Gambit there. If they actually hit that thing at all, it's the wrong play. We've seen it twice now in the last hour and a half that's the wrong play. Instead, <laughs> security is the play for Gambit. Get a Guardian Angel on your main carry. Get tanky on the frontliners. Or in Darian's case, screw it, just buy a Bloodthirster. That's tanky enough for you. Uh, and it's just, it's just have the threats. It's been the game plan all along. You should have real team fights with really powerful champions. Now, the split push game will be hard because Dada has Destiny and Alex does not have Teleport. And Dandy can make a play with this. Oh, Dandy's picking a fight. Gold card goes down. Massacre is up. Darian kick backwards. Remember, he's melee. He needs to be hitting to getting that lifesteal back. He's doing the best he can, but on top of that hail of arrows, it's not going to work out. Voidal gets caught by a cocoon in the background. That's going to keep him backwards. Darian is taken down, but Kenja wants to play. He's going to be in range for that Void who's been not going to be enough. Now, without Darian, Ozone are turning towards Baron. This is going to be risky. Smite is still up for Diamond Prox. And they've got all their important ultimates available How as well. How many wards? A lot. They're going to need them. A pick means everything right here. 45 seconds without Darien. Ozone might just be too gun shy for this one, but they could push mid. 5v4 is an inhibitor. Gambit will play interference as long as they can. There are super minions in the base of Ozone. You can see that stream of red lights pouring down. The longer Gambit can keep Ozone back, the more damage they can possibly do to those Nexus turrets. Ozone, gonna try to reply here with an inhibitor, but there is a Strangle Thorns available. We'll see if Gambit can go in. They've gotta be careful, the engager catches Voidal! Voidal's caught, Strangle Thorns goes down. Crescendo has been used already. Alex in the background, they've traded support for support. Where is Genja? That is the question. He's backing away. Dandy's doing the best he can to survive, but the inhibitor still stands. Oh. Alex and Genja close it out. Now Dade is gonna be hit. That's a flash ball from Diamond. They've got him, they've got Dade. They're on to Lupa. Diamond Brock still alive. Hate spikes going down. And I tell you what, Lupa hates he leave right now. He's get taken out. This has to be the game. Gambino rushing for the Nexus. There's 30 seconds until any respawns are back. The inhibitor is dead. There are super minions coming down the mid lane. This could be the quarterfinals for Gambit. They are rushing this one down. Keep your eyes on those death timers. Kenja is untouched. 
Darien has respawned and is running down the lane. There are no minions here. They have to tank this one up. But Genji's got that Guardian Angel as well. They should be able to finish this game. Gambit, after almost throwing this game, look to secure the spot in the quarters. There's a super minion still. One second. There's Sona. 13 seconds left on Lee Sin. They might have just enough damage. Everything is burned. This will be Gambit in to the quarterfinals. Ladies and gentlemen, in dramatic fashion, after stealing a Baron to defeat Vulcan to force the tiebreaker, they lose Baron against Ozo and bounce back. The crowd is cheering and this performance deserves it. They Absolutely. definitely made it exciting. They really did. I mean, the Baron play was scary. Gambit, I don't know why you did it. But at the end of the game, the, the plays that they made, they fought 4v5 inside their base, base with 15 seconds until Darian responds saying, you know what? You caught Voidal. It's basically 3v5. Screw it, we think we can do it. And Gambit made the play happen undermanned. That just shows you their confidence, their individual skill, and their preparation for that game. I have two last things to add about this. 13 to 9 Alexich Kassadin. 10-1-10, Trinity Force Cogmore for Genji. Yeah. What a massive game impact those two had. And you know what? I think the fact that there were so many damage threats, it didn't matter who you focused if you were Ozone, because Gambit would just say, hey, I tell you what, I'll tap somebody else in to kill you, because we can all do it. And they, they could, and you actually saw how well Gambit even danced their aggro, because every single person who was a damage threat late game had two lives. So we talked about the blood well, we talked about the Evelyn ultimate, we talked about actually eventually uh, Genja adding a guardian angel to make sure, but then as well with Alex H, instead of doing the rift walk in flash out, it was the rift walk in, oh they're hitting me Zonius. And then by the time Zonius had come back up, he could rift walk back out or onto another target. And it was this two-stage sort of engage where they got the initial burst, took no damage in return because it was shielded or something else, and then came in again for a second kill. That comp was genius by uh, Gambit, and the play was perfect. I cannot wait to hear what Riv and the guys at the analyst desk have to say about breaking down Gambit's incredibly clutch win. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And there is quite a bit to talk about here. Just from the start, picks and bans, seeing Imp on Varus, the gold sways throughout the game. And we are going to start in picks and bans. You know, Jat, what mm. were we looking at and a little bit more? So this thing that happened with Ozone in the World Championship is I felt like they had a two-pronged attack initially going in. It was Dade and Imp. Dade played off the entire World Championship, and he was on Twisted Fate. And even though in the context of their overall composition, Varus made sense, in the context of the team, it does not, because he can't make the plays that he's accustomed to making when they win. And I, did, I just didn't like their overall composition because of that fact. Well, of course. And I mean, who's been coming up big in these wins for, right. for Ozone when it's they have Looper won? Looper a lot of the time. It, it's Looper, it's Dandy, and it's Imp. And Imp has had just immensely good teamfight presence on Vayne over the last couple of games. But they decide to put him onto Varus here, which mm -hmm. is a champion he is very comfortable with. But without another kind of big carry right here, and they had to put Looper on a lease that meant to get some more damage output, but then that left them without much of a tank, and against Cassidy and Kogma, that's going to cause you huge problems in the late game, which is pretty much exactly what we saw. Varus is also incredibly weak against Assassins, and, and Gambit ran three Assassins, Aatrox, Eve, and Cassidy, especially Cassidy. It's just really awful because Cassidy, as you can see this game, he built Merc Treads, he was unaffected by Varus's ulti, and he can just dance around the fight while Varus is in a very immobile AD carry. Imp had to really carry this game because Dotted didn't play the best game of his life, and obviously he couldn't do anything, just outmatched. Prepo, thoughts about it? I just think the virus pick could have worked, for yeah. a, but only up to a certain point in minutes in the game. And you, if you mm -hmm. make one mistake against the Cassidy, as you saw, like Frogan tweeted that earlier as well, you, you just, you can't get there. It's, it's really hard. Like Cassidy snowballs so hard. That's why so many people in mid lane in Europe are so scared of it. That's why. Mm -hmm. That's actually one of the reasons why the the mid lane meta game in Europe evolved to having lost pick mid lane. That's why some people actually consider picking purple over blue. First pick isn't as important because it basically removes Cassidy as a ban, and Cassidy is a counter pick to a lot of the the favorable mid lanes. And you know, Mani, you know, to direct this at you, how do we feel about Ozone coming in here using Looper, you know, the entire time with the option to be in, in different positions? I, I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of incredulous after their repeated performance. Ulm is here. Ulm is in this building right now. Yeah. And they 
chose repeatedly not to use him, even though they did look quite weak. Uh, they were exposed very early on in this tournament. And it's, it's somewhat baffling to me. I have no idea the reasoning behind it, but... Although we've got to wonder. We still have to say that Looper played really good he games. Did. He did. Although he played a lot of champions that he overlapped with, with home on his champions pool. Maybe it's particularly for this game, knowing that uh, Gambit had a really bad track record against Zac, uh, 0-8 now, I believe, the last few mm -hmm. games. Right. Uh, maybe maybe they should have put in home and, and just let him play Zach because as far as I know, he's a really, really strong Zach player. He is, and in fact, his synergy with Dandy earned them a lot of first bloods in Korea in that mm -hmm. lane, I even against like very strong top laners like Flame from CJ Blaze. So it is kind of a mystery. And I mean, what was also mysterious about this game a little bit too, we were looking at that bottom tower fight uh, when Ozone had a lead of a few K. And coming into that too, at the second tier, that's going back to the cast and snowball as well. That's really what started getting Alex it's rocking, right? Mm -hmm. And they they kind of just sat mm -hmm. there, took a lot of damage, didn't trade a lot back in return. Dade, after most of his team was dead, poured it into that lane, allowing Darien to split push. So they gave up three or four kills, tier two top right. turret, and a dragon. All at once. Four and a half thousand swinging mm -hmm. gold there. Yeah, and not only was Dade not there, and I feel like this may be beating a dead horse, but I just, you really have to point out that Dade was nearly 100 CS down as a TF, which is not normal. Against a Kassadin, you should be greatly out CSing him. You should, he had, he ended the game with around 380 AP at 46 minutes, or 40. Four minutes, I Partly say. due to a misclick on the... On the yeah, on that was talked about yeah. tilting earlier, but nerves also fall into that buying items that yeah, you don't that was, need. Yeah, that was definitely a big nerve thing. When he bought a Magia Soul Stealer, got zero stacks out of it, based, and then sold it and to buy an Hourglass, that was like a huge waste of several hundred gold that really could have changed the game. I really think that overall here, throughout the entire World Championship, Ozone just never had synergy. Not nope. once. Coming in... Maybe it was because Ohm wasn't reliable for them. Maybe it's because they had to change their roster. Maybe it's because they hadn't traveled before. But just looking back at this now, the fact that two mm -hmm. European teams are moving on from this group, not a single one of us predicted that. And I don't think many people online did far, as far as maybe like a crazy European fanboy would have. But it's it's Crazy ridiculous. European fanboy? Educated <laughs> European fanboy. <laughs> I just want to still want to go back on, the, on that tower that where everything went wrong and Kassin started snowballing. Uh, actually, I don't want to point the blame on Dada there. It's just his team was pushing without him. They, we clearly saw he based and he was walking mm -hmm. towards the race. And then he did a maximum range teleport to the lane, which basically ended up being useless. They, they tried to hide in the brush. They tried to pull a Fnatic on Gambit. Angle cut out, took another two two people down and got the tower there. So that was like a multitude of misplays. The first one pushing without TF, which is horrible. You, this this early like early siege will only work if you if you're everybody's there and they can just push because Darian he was stuck in the in the top lane. He was not had no possibility of coming close to helping and you just gotta they could have sieged really easily with their composition, uh, with, with the lead they had, but they just gave Cassidy a chance to jump in and if you're not with enough people you will not punish Cassidy jumping in. So as Team C, you know, what happens and how the game has been absolutely swaying so much at Baron, I think within the last few games, people are taking it way more into consideration. Do you guys think it's going to change the games as we move on in the groups? I think a lot of that has to do with the shot calling that's going on. Um, when you start an objective like Baron or Dragon, immediately the shot caller needs to say, we're turning or we're actually finishing it, which would result in a 50-50 smite war, which is exactly what you saw. If the call is to turn, which is the correct call because you don't want to get in a 50-50 smite when you're that far ahead. There's almost no way you can lose the game when you're that far ahead, except as you see at these Baron 50-50s. And, and you can completely avoid this. You can A, not do Baron, or B, just bait it so that you can start a team fight. And you just see uh, the same mistake happen, I guess, twice in a row. We have to give props to Dandy, though. That was a flash, max range smite steal at the right given time. He yeah. was absolutely amazing. I think Money even had a nickname for him. Oh yeah, Doe and I call Danny the King of Thieves because this is not uncommon for him to do. He's had numerous clutch steals. Yeah, in fact, even to get them into the second seed, the third place game in Champion Summer, he had a smite steal in game five against CJ Enches Frost. It's an incredibly clutch move, and it's actually, it's unfortunate. I mean, here at the World Championships, not every team gets to move on, but I mean, with all the mistakes Ozone made throughout, no, they, they regardless of how well Danny played, they did not really deserve to move no, on. No, they definitely did not deserve to move on, and I said earlier, I'm happy Gambit's moving on, because I find Gambit the more reliable team to watch right now, and Ozone came here, they look unprepared, they decided to use substitute players for, for good or bad, but... They, they don't deserve to move on to the quarterfinals. I really hope a lot of teams, including Gavit, will now start using Baron more as a tool to bait enemy 
enemy players instead of actually going for that Baron. Hey, can we finish it? We don't know. Ah, well, let's try it anyways. Worst case, we back out because that just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times you start you start a Baron thinking, yeah, if they know, if they realize, we can back out. But by then it's so late that people are like, yeah, why not? Why not try and finish it? But then you're essentially giving the enemies a 50% chance to steal. And a lot of jungles actually tell me that it's easier to steal a Baron because you have no pressure. You don't. The, the Baron's technically in your head. The Baron's lost, and you can only win it. As opposed to the under jungle, he can only lose that Baron. Because if you get your Baron stolen from you, mm -hmm. you're the mocking <laughs> spot. If you're the steal, you're the hero. So it's it's a it's a little weight difference on it. All right, so we have Fnatic and Gambit moving on. How do you feel that these guys are going to weigh in coming into you know Najin Sword, Royal, Cloud Nine, and Gamma as well with these matchups? Well, to be honest, I think Gambit has been looking a little shaky. I mean, yeah, they did pull out the win against Ozone, but they didn't have a spectacular score coming into the group, or coming out of the group, mm -hmm, I should say. Right. And and I feel like they're going to have a hard time unless, potentially, if they draw Gambit Bears, who people kind of immediately discount because, you know, they're not very well known. Um, their top four finish may be in jeopardy. They're, they're consistent top four finishes at every mm -hmm. land. I think, especially with Gambit, more so than any other team, they turn it on at the very last minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they wait until they're down a game. Like, if they move on, it'll be three games, <laughs> they'll have a 7,000 gold disadvantage, and then they'll come back and win. That, that was seems a, to be the way it was. Was still really late. Really late. Waiting for that tower push for the enemy team to turn it out was a yeah. pretty late. I would have liked them to turn it out a little earlier I for feel Europe's like sake. their manager, Constantine, would also like them to go a little <laughs> sooner. But, oh man, it's, it's exciting to watch, at least.